Unilever is one of the largest commissioners of market research in the world. Uh, we do market research in over 150 countries. We literally speak to millions of people every year. And from across all this research, I've been noticing that something is beginning to build. So what's causing this move amongst all the market research? Maybe it's the increased frequency of climate-related disasters being uh, piped into our living rooms. Images of hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, extreme uh, weather all over the world. Or maybe it's the increased voices of concern from people talking on social media about companies being involved in child labor or deforesting huge swathes of the planet, destroying communities and habitats on the way. But whatever's causing it, we are beginning to get to the edge of something. And companies like ours and others need to understand what's going on and engage with it. Because what our market research is picking up is people are beginning to shift. They're shifting from the my world, the my world where I'm focused about my children, uh, my family, my friends, uh, through the focus on the our world, where it's communities and schools and villages, to increasingly being careful and concerned about the world. So if you ask people now about are they concerned about how products are made or where they're sourced, increasingly the answer is a resounding yes. And they're not just talking about it, they're acting on it as well. So to borrow a phrase from uh, Boston Consultancy Group, uh, responsible consumption. Responsible consumption sales in the US are now growing at 9% per year and account for 15% of US retail sales. But it's not just a uh, developed world phenomena. I'm seeing this rumble across the world. So whether it be China and India, or whether it be Africa and Brazil and beyond, we're increasingly seeing people engaging in this. The photograph in the middle is uh, where I was just a few months ago. And I was in India, in fact, in deepest rural India. And the lady in the picture is a smallholder farmer. Uh, the village she lived in was a, a humble village. Uh, we didn't have uh, any running water in any of the houses. There was no sanitation, so everyone was openly defecating. And they had electricity for about two hours a day. But what was striking is virtually every house had a mobile phone. And through that mobile phone, they were very much connected to the world. And this lady knew about what was going on in the world and how things that were going on in the world were going to impact prices uh, of crops, not just in the market far away, but the one just down the road where she sold her crops. She did care about the world, and she increasingly knew about the world. Now, this is important because if we're going to make sustainable living commonplace, we need to engage at scale. We need companies to engage at scale. We need governments to engage at scale. Companies are interested in scale demand for consumers because they see that as an opportunity to, uh, to get growth, an opportunity to help people get something they're looking for. And governments are increasingly engaging in this because they see on social media um, consumers and people increasingly concerned about sustainability and what's going to happen in this world. So for the first time, really, we're seeing that voters and consumers are coming together with one voice, one voice of change. So one thing is understanding it, but what do companies like a Unilever or a Nike or an Ikea or a Disney do about this? Well, we've been working, as you know, in this area for a few years, and I'd like to share with you uh, some lessons, um, some lessons we've learned. Really just try and inspire uh, new ideas, inspire new ideas for many of you, uh, or maybe confirm something you're doing and encourage you to go further. But whether it be inspiration or motivation or challenge, uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this which will take the whole agenda forward. So firstly, sustainability needs to be mainstreamed across the business if it's going to make an impact and make sustainable living commonplace. You can't have a corporate social responsibility department in one corner of the company expect to do the whole sustainability agenda. It can't be an add-on. It has to be mainstreamed across the business. And to do that, you need a plan. You need a plan just like a business plan. You need a plan with objectives and measures and key performance indicators, a plan that is held at the top of the business, a plan which is reported against internally and externally. And for us, it wasn't until we started to think about this idea of mainstreaming sustainability did we start getting real traction. 
So we had to destroy things as well as build things. So we took apart the corporate social responsibility department. We don't have one any longer. And instead, we built the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan as a core about how we were going to do this across the business. And we started with a big mission. We wanted to double our business while reducing our environmental footprint and increasing our positive social impact. In essence, what we wanted to do is we want to decouple growth from the negative impact of growth. So let me explain that a little bit more. So normally, when uh, companies grow, as the volume goes up, so does the environmental impact as well. And we wanted to decouple uh, those two lines. So we started like any other good company. We started our own operations. We looked at our factories, we looked uh, at our offices, our distribution, uh, and how were we going to make it more sustainable. But then we soon realized that that wasn't enough. We weren't going to make sustainability a real core agenda for this business unless we looked at the whole footprint across the value chain. So from the uh, suppliers and the farms, right the way through to consumers using our products and disposing them. And that whole environmental footprint is what we're going to measure for each and every one of our products. So when it comes to the irrigation in crops, tomatoes, tea or whatever, that water would be in the footprint of the product that we are creating. Or whether it be heating the water for a washing machine, the greenhouse gases that came from heating that water would be in the environmental footprint of our product. So across the whole value chain, we created a plan for all countries and all brands. And we created a plan that was going to be measured against some big goals. So, for instance, we wanted to help a billion people improve their health and well-being. And we started this back in 2010, and three years into the plan, we're now at 303 million. So we're on track, but still a lot to do. Or we also wanted to say that we wanted to source all our agricultural raw materials sustainably by 2020. So the tea, the soy, the tomatoes, all sourced sustainably by 2020. When we started, we had but 14% sourced sustainably. Now, we have 48% sourced sustainably. But let me try and explain what that means uh, with one example, tea. So we're the largest tea uh, buyers in the world, uh, with uh, brands like Lipton and others. So we've been working with the Rainforest Alliance, with smallholder farmers, step by step, uh, to work out how we can do things sustainably. What I mean by sustainably is whether it be socially sustainably with the local uh, community, or whether it be environmentally sustainable as far as we can keep producing without degrading the land over and over again, without taking from the planet. On both of those, that's what we'd call sustainable. And we've been building that now, I say, over the last three years. We're all already on tea more than 50%. And of course, the target with tea, like everything else, is 100% by 2020. And we report against this. So we do have the plan. We have over 50 time-based targets. And we report every year. And you can see what we're doing. We report very publicly. We report internally. We report externally. And you won't be surprised when we hit objectives. We celebrate them, and we're very proud of them. But equally, we're transparent when we're missing as well. And I think that's part of the, the focus of where we're missing. We're asking for help from stakeholders and others. How can we close that gap? How can we get back on plan? Because what we've realized, ourselves and other businesses, and indeed increasingly governments, that the cost of inaction is now more than the cost of action. So when people ask me, you know, what is the business case for sustainability? I always answer, I would love to see the business case for the alternative. The second area is about experimenting and learning. Look, this is a new area. It's a new area for all of us. But so often we come at it with the same business constructs, the same business models. So we've been looking at different business constructs, different business models, and very much felt that what was right for us five years ago is not going to be right for us now and into the future. So I'll give you some examples. We put together some very different bedfellows. In most businesses, the marketing department are over there in one corner selling more stuff. Uh, the sustainability department's over here trying to save the planet. Uh, and then over here, you have the comms team, uh, who ha usually have corporate social responsibility, uh, looking for great stories and pictures for the annual report, etc. And what we did is we put those three together under a single leadership uh, with a simple goal to make sustainable living commonplace. 
Now, I can't for a second suggest it was an easy journey. And the last five years have been pretty bumpy. Uh, when you start off, the, the marketeers were incredibly suspicious of the people from sustainability, that somehow they were going to handcuff them and uh, restrict what they could do, etc. And similarly, the sustainability guys thought the marketing guys were shallow and short term and weren't going to uh, be able to help at all in any way. But increasingly, when we put them together uh, with this single goal, very clear focus, uh, we have realized that actually the whole sustainability agenda, so social, environmental, and indeed the financial agenda of growth and profit can come together in a very focused way, and you can make sustainability very much the heart of your business model. But it's not just internally that I'm seeing sort of new constructs. I think what's really quite exciting, there's a lot going on in the world externally as well. And within my 30 years of business, I have never seen this level of public and private partnership coming together in a really profound way, really transformational collaboration. So I want to use an example to bring this alive. And this is this one here around net zero deforestation. 15% of the greenhouse gases in the world is caused by deforestation. And there are four commodities that are the principal drivers of that. There is soy, there is palm oil, there is beef, there's uh, timber and paper products. The Consumer Goods Forum, the Consumer Goods Forum is an association of more than 600 companies, uh, big companies from all around the world. Together, their revenues are three trillion dollars, three trillion dollars. And back in 2010, they all made a commitment that they would stop buying these four commodities by 2020 if they didn't come from sustainable sources. Now, that sent a huge market signal. And since then, banks have got involved, governments have got involved, uh, NGOs. Uh, they've formed the Tropical Forest Alliance. And with the Tropical Forest Alliance, with that very goal to drive this through to completion, we now have the potential to halve the impact of greenhouse gases due to deforestation. I think it's an incredible uh, focus, incredible project. But what I've learned from it is whole system change is possible with transformational collaboration. The third and final one I'd like to share with you is engaging at scale. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. It all comes down to us uh, and others. People at scale. And when we talk about this subject, we so quickly look at the supply part of social and environmental sustainability. We talk about deforestation, as I have just done now. We talk about sustainable farming. We don't talk enough about the demand side. And I said at the beginning, the demand is beginning to grow. And there's some really interesting experiments going on right now about how do we engage more people? How do we engage the next generation in this whole area? And one of the projects we've done is a, a project called Unilever Project Sunlight. It's only a pilot phase. We've launched in five countries uh, so far. We launched at the end of last year, so we haven't even been running for a year yet. But the fact that over 100 million videos and stories have been shared in those five countries already really shows there's an appetite to start engaging in all this. And we're seeing the start of a, a movement, not just here, but elsewhere, of people wanting to share stories, share stories about food waste or recycling. We want to share what they're doing as a family versus other families. And we're beginning to realize that we're moving from some marketing to consumers to mattering to people. Because you can't have a healthy business in an unhealthy society. So I said at the beginning, we're beginning to move to the edge of something. People are engaging, and they're starting to engage at scale. And there's never been a better time to build a brighter future and make sustainable living commonplace. Thank you.